You started off in television. I started off in television, yeah. What was your first television show? Well, I was a scenic artist. Oh, painting sets. Pa painting sets for CBC, and it was in the early days of, uh, of, uh, of things, the, the, the books, uh, all these little musicals. Uh, oh, God, I can't remember them, them all now. Hidden Pages was the one that uh, was uh, produced by the libraries. Uh, in a studio with an enormous studio. amount of very bright lights just oh, baking bright lights. everything eight from the top. Eight foot high sets, you know, That's right. six cameramen running around on huge dollies, you know. That's right. and, and pedestals, et cetera, et cetera. And, it, and, and then when I went to CTV, I designed some com, uh, commercial productions there, you know, like quiz shows and what have you, and then I got out of it. I, I wasn't, it wasn't doing it for me. And uh, that's when I went back into over to England and, and trained. But when, and when you trained at the Wimbledon School Wimbledon of Art? Wimbledon College of Art, yeah, Wimbledon and who School your, of Art. Who were your teachers at the Wimbledon School? Oh, I had some of the best in the world, to be quite honest. Uh, Richard Negre was the head of the department became my mentor. In many ways, I can still hear his voice in my mind. He passed away a few years ago, quite a few years ago now. I still hear him, and I still quote him to myself when I'm sitting trying to figure out what to do with a production. How am I going to approach this work? I'm not seeing anything. Right. He would, he would, his, his, his quote to me one day when it happened in class, I was drying, I couldn't, didn't know what to do. He just said, fall back onto your basics. Go back into your basics of art training. And that was what I still do to this day. If, if, I'm, if I go back and I start looking at paintings and reading some literature and whatever the case may be, and, and fall back onto my basic training, you know, and then it starts to grow again. Is it important for artists to have mentors? I think so. I mean, previous figures that kind of, yeah. in a way... Oh, yeah. I had some great ones. Great ones. Who else were your mentors? Um, well, there was a, a chap by the name of Robert Stanbury. He, he was the person who was a sort of uh, uh, administrator of the theater department, but he also taught lighting design. And he was, uh, he was basically a Slade person. Um, their, their family, I a think, Slade is, person, yeah, Slade that? Arts College, college, uh, performing arts college. He was, he was from Slade, and that is the the you can't you can't go to Slade unless you've got your degree and your basic arts, and then you have to go before a board. It's a bit like getting your master's. You've got to defend yourself and your work in front of a right. board, and then they decide if they're going to take you on or not. It's very British, and then um, the other one was. Uh, <laughs> Bucknell, Peter S. Bucknell, the headmaster of the college, one of the most colorful characters I've ever met in my life. Came to school one day with a pink water bottle on one half of him and a blue water bottle on the other half and a big scarf around his neck. And I said, Peter, why are you wearing a pink and blue water bottle? He said, I haven't made up my mind which sex I am yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay. He was the one that took me aside one day when I was ready to pack it in. I was going to go back to Canada. I'd had enough of this British training. The way they were, they were just tearing me apart, just pulling me down. It's the way they worked, like getting you right down like plasticine, just so something they can mold in the palms of their hand. And I'd had it, because I'd had a lot, of a lot of experience in television and stage, what have you. And um, he said, listen, try and find the courage to stick it out. He said, Lee, and I told him, I said, listen, I, I, can, I can paint, I can build, I can do all this stuff, you know. He said, put it all in a bag and put it at the back of the closet. And when your training is finished, you can go to the closet and pick up your bag and go home then. Hmm. I always say, I left my bag in that closet in England. Hmm. Never went back to, to what that, that way of working. Right. The bag of tricks that we all had, that we all thought we'd survive in the theater. And That's right. At a certain point, all you've just got to leave them behind. The armor, the tricks, the old fallbacks. Absolutely. Backs. The actors have got them as well. We've got to hold bags. Suitcases, yeah. we call Suitcases. them. Suitcases, yeah. yeah. Well, it was the same thing with me. and uh, Left all that behind. And what was in that bag? Oh, my ability to know the colors and paint. I could, I could paint a backdrop, you know, 200 feet long, 30 feet tall in a couple of days. You know, all that kind of te technique. Um, the technique of, of scenery, and lighting, all the things that we learned as craft. It right. was a bag of craft is what it was. 
It wasn't an artist's portfolio. It was a bag of craft. And also the previous version of who we were. Yeah, you know. exactly. Which is what everybody thought we were. Yeah. So it's, uh, you know, he was, that, was, that was probably the thing that saved my life, uh, was that particular moment in the hall of the art college when he said that to me. And, and how old were you? I was an older student. I was about 23, 24 at the time. But I wasn't the older student in that college. The, the youngest person in the class was 17 or 18. He was an inspired, inspired young artist. And I was the oldest student in that class. But in the art college, I met a lot of people in the 30s and 40s. You know, they were still there. And how do you keep fresh as an artist? How do you keep from getting stale, from repeating, from? From repeating? From repeating, from falling back on Onto cliches. Things that have worked before. That's, that's difficult because it's very easy to do that. It's very easy to fall back onto past techniques that have worked for you and bring them up. I'm not saying that I don't. I think it's very difficult to not fall back on some, some things. I know directors do it. There's certain what's called directing styles, you know, and they, they fall back onto what's what's worked in other shows. Actors. And actors as well, <laughs> yes, yes, I know. Two steps forward, one step back. Um, the, I think what it is, and I have to go back and say it over and over again, is go back to that black box and find that character. If I repeat anything, I repeat that basic foundation, or the, the process, in the process. That's what I repeat over and over and over again and start with the model. In other words, start with, the, my diploma is, is, is three-dimensional, is an artist in three-dimensional design in brackets theater, you see. What do you mean, that's what it says on yeah, the diploma? Yeah, that's what it is, yeah, that's what I graduated with. An artist in three-dimensional three design, design in brackets theater. Isn't that strange? No, it's not strange. Well, because it's logical. It's, I'm a sculptor. I mean, yeah. I, when I exhibited my work in Russia, a sculptor came up to me and says, Cameron, you're a sculptor. I never thought of myself as one, but I'm working in the three dimension like a sculptor. Yeah. So, so that, in a, in a sense, the, the, the whole process of working with the model first in the three dimension, moving the actors around. I take some shortcuts now. I used to sit there and model these little munchkins, as Bill Miller in Vancouver used to say, You're making little munchkins to move around on, this, on your model box. I still make the munchkins, but usually now it's at the end of the process that, that I finish off the model with three dimensional actors on the stage in costume, etc. What I use now is dolly pins. <laughs> You know these closed pegs right. that you can get, you know, crap. And I cut them to the little ball with the two legs coming down the dolly pin. I cut them to the height of an actor, and I have a box full of five foot six, five foot ten, six foot six five of these dolly pins, and they work brilliantly because in, when I did Gigi, I had thirty five actors on stage. I put all the do thirty five dolly pins in in on the stage where they they had to be, so I could see the space properly. Right. So you work in the three dimension, then you go to the technical, you go to the plan. Okay, a young designer comes out of school mm -hmm. and you get to spend an hour with that young designer and you want to plant something in them, inspire them, what would you say to a young designer? <laughs> I, I don't know what I would say to them. Sometimes I'd like to say, you know, find another profession because you're going to make, you know, make some money. You're not going to make it in this one, that's for sure. But if he's an inspired artist, what have you, I would, I would probably tell him that, that to read history, read a lot of history, look at a lot of art, listen to a lot of classical music, good music, and remember that the actor is the first reality on the stage and start with that. And, and if you do that, I don't see how you can go wrong. You can, yeah, you might be able to go wrong, of course you can. You design for theater and uh, for, you design for television and film as well. In yeah. a nutshell, how do you change your instincts from a th designer of the black box to a designer of the frame? <laughs> um, yeah. 
the, the film and television, you're designing for a camera. You're not designing for an audience. So you are designing for the frame of the camera, what the camera sees. And that's one of the disciplines that, that you have to learn, is just design what the camera sees. It's wonderful to be able to get into a feature film or something where you can design 360 degrees and create a whole naturalistic real world of some form or another. But one of the things that I find so exciting about the stuff I've been doing, which has been a lot Canadian, low budget films, is the fact that, that I haven't got all that money. I just don't have it. And you have to, 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 to make something look like a million dollars on a dollar fifty. And, and uh, you know what if I say, you know, shoot it like a shotgun means, if, to, to shoot shotgun? No, what does that mean? It, it means that you, you, you only design what the camera is seeing and it's like radiates out from the lens in there and that's what you do. I was doing a show in Ireland and we, I had to make it look like a busy, busy street in London during the 17th century. Well, who's got the money to do this? So I said to the DOP, this is an establishing shot. You know, the director has said that I can do it in shotgun style. He said, where's the camera going? He said, well, the camera's going to go here. And I said, fine, got a stake on the ground. I said, now, what do you see over there? And he's looking through the and he says, well, that, that gate right over there. And I said, fine, I had somebody flag the gate. What do you see over here? There, flag that, fine. Took two tapes, yellow tapes, on right. the ground, right to the camera, right. and said to the set decorators, and right, now go to town within that space. Right. Oh, they had carts and horses and people and extras right. and what have you. And it was only this big. What you, you saw a whole world on, t on the television. So when we were in Prague doing the, the little Bizet yeah. uh, film, mm -hmm. you're rushing around trying to find this prop and that prop and this look mm -hmm. and that. Is there more improvisation to that kind of designing for television in this case? Well, we were doing historical films, you know, they, they, were, they were all historical or period film. And in many ways, that is very, very difficult, especially here in the New World, to do 18th century or 17th century pieces. But over there, it was a piece of cake, right. because it was all there, those, those great prop houses of Barandoff Studios, you know, the great film studios from Lenny Reifenstahl's day, you know. Um, they, they were all there, and yes, I was uh, running around trying to get a prop in because how you, the other thing is how you rent is usually by the day or by the week or whatever the case may be. So I would have to coordinate in such a way that the prop would arrive at a certain time, go into the shot, get it out. I was also running around doing locations at the same time because I would go choose the locations that were periodically correct for what we were shooting. Right. And of course, the streets of Prague, even though they're beautifully Baroque and, and this wonderful, wonderful architecture, you've got modern things like electrical cables coming down. The drain pipes had not been invented yet, you know, all that kind of stuff. Camouflage, 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 camouflage. Can you tell me the parachute story? Uh huh. When I was a very young boy in Saskatchewan, um, it was during the war. And I used to read these comic books, and there was one called Captain Canuck, and then there was G.I. Joe and all that. And on the back pages of the comic books, they would have all these anecdotes of what was going on in the war, how to make a Molotov cocktail, you know, so do it your home bomb blowing up things. And one of them was a para how a parachute works. So I went and got a bed sheet from my mother's drawer. And you're and how old? I, th I think I was 12 or less, or somewhere around 12 years of age. I was not a teenager, I can tell you that. Um, because we left to go to Vancouver when I was a teenager, at 13 or 12, 13. So I think I was 11 or 12, maybe 11. And I did the strings and everything, you know, from all the corners and what have you, and put them together and tied them. And I didn't know what the hell I was doing. So I tied them into two bunches and hold on. I rolled the whole thing up, got up on top of the roof of the barn, which seemed to be like five miles high, but I think it was no more than maybe 25 feet or something like that, and jumped off the roof. When I came to, <laughs> I hit the ground with a whack, you know, leaving an imprint of my body in the dusty Saskatchewan soil. And I just rolled it up and put it away, and I didn't go there anymore on that. But but that, that's the parachute story, and that's where the people say, ah, leaping into the void, are you?